may call upon Lewis K to close the entire symposium. Um, so I don't really think Lewis needs much in the way of introduction. Of course, he's here at the University of Toronto and his credentials really do speak for themselves with seminal contributions to protein structure and dynamics. Um, they've been recognized internationally, uh, most recently with awards in Canada, um, Gardner Foundation International Award, Hertzberg Medal. And so it really is my pleasure to call on Lewis to close our symposium. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction and for the opportunity uh, to speak here and to summarize what's been a really terrific day honoring a, a great colleague, Bill Reynolds. Now, I thought that I would begin, uh, if I can advance the slides, by um, making a confession. And that confession is that I used to be actually an NMR snob. I thought that the highest form of NMR spectroscopy involves studies of proteins. And I have to also tell you that I'm uh, a person who studies by NMR proteins. Uh, but um, I've changed. And what I want to do you today, today is to tell you why, in fact, I, I made the transition. So let me, first of all, begin by summarizing what I do for a living. Uh, and I'm going to start by showing a, actually a, a figure that I stole from one of Ad Bax's very nice reviews, uh, where I illustrate a number of different um, sizes of uh, polypeptides ranging from 23 amino acids all the way up to 156 amino acids. You can see that for the 23 amino acid small uh, little peptide, uh, there's a small number of lines, or relatively speaking, and they're quite narrow, as you can see. Uh, in a region from say 0. 0.6 to 1.2 ppm. As we go up to 58 amino acids, which is still tiny, about 10% the average size of a human protein, the number of lines has increased rather dramatically and they've gotten uh, somewhat fatter. And then if we look at 156 amino acids, which is still pretty tiny as far as proteins go, you can see that there are an awful lot of lines and the lines tend to be very broad and all on top of one another. So the complexity is increased very, very uh, significantly. And I want to study things that are even bigger than 156 amino acids. I want to go to things that have molecular weights on the order of 1,200 kilodons. And what I show you here is from a review in 2015 by Remco Sprangers, a former uh, postdoc of mine, uh, sort of highlighting some of the really big complexes that uh, are studied by NMR. And you have some of my favorites, the proteasome, the proteasome attached to things on both ends, the, the nucleosome and, and, and others. So you can see that we want to go to very, very, very uh, big objects. Uh, and we want to study them by solution NMR. And so how do we actually go about doing that? Well, what we do is we're sort of deconstructionists. Uh, solution NMR people are that want to study proteins. And that's a bit of a problem. What we do is we take this beautiful uh, protein that we have here, where these, light, these white balls are, of course, protons, and we simply chop them off. But then we realize that you can't lose all of the white balls, so we, we add some. And, and to make it novel, uh, we just color the balls a little bit differently. These are magenta balls. They happen to be the balls of methyl groups. Methyl groups, of course, are uh, proteinaceous, C13H3s, if we C13 label them. And uh, we use these uh, methyl protons as probes of uh, molecular structure and dynamics. So, um, you know, we think that we're really smart as protein uh, uh, guys and gals, but in, in fact, that's not the case because we've eliminated most of the protons in our molecule. It improves the lifetimes of signals that remain, but at what cost? I mean, what's the fun if there's no spins to play with? Now, to be certain, there's still a methyl groups around, and methyl groups are a little bit complicated. They involve lots of transitions. You have these vertical lines here, which are proton transitions. The horizontal lines are carbon transitions. And you can play games with single quantum, double quantum, even triple quantum uh, spectroscopies and learn some, uh, some rather interesting things that way. So there's a little bit of spin physics that uh, remains. But then what we do, uh, and I'm guilty of this. This is a pulse sequence that we developed. We take our C13H3s, the last sort of stronghold of protons that we have, and we chop off two protons. We make it into a CHD2. So then it's basically an AX spin system. 
uh, and which is you know, rather boring, even if the pulse sequences look rather uh, sophisticated. So that hardly seems like we're at the top of the food chain. We've really deconstructed our molecules with the richness of, of spins and gotten rid of the majority of them. Um, so let's look at this in the contrast of what small molecule NMR uh, spectroscopists might do. Of course, they're studying small molecules. These molecules have very long signal lifetimes. So if you have a long lifetime of, for your signal, that allows an experimentalist to come up with very clever manipulations to dissect out from a myriad of interactions the particular interaction or set of interactions that he or she wants to look at. Artifacts are readily apparent. I mean, if I run a pulse sequence on something that's 1.2 megadaltons, I'm happy if I just see a spectrum, if I just see a few peaks. There's no way there's going to be any artifacts, not because the experiment's so, so clever, but just because the signal to noise is so bad. In contrast, the single molecule people see their artifacts in general, which means that they really, really have to understand their experiments. There's absolutely no ex excuses. You can't hide behind peaks that are too fat. And if the signal, you know, the signal, the case before you can do anything in my case, but certainly not in the case of small molecule NMR spectroscopists. And these fat lines, of course, obscure artifacts and other experimental sins that therefore protein NMR people don't have to worry about or don't blissfully, you know, don't even realize exist. Furthermore, small molecules are really, really important. They form the basis for many drugs. It's something like 30 billion a year in sales in Canada alone. Small molecules contribute about a half of this. So these are really significant uh, molecules to uh, pursue. And in the case of uh, small molecules, NMR is unequivocally the most powerful analytical tool for their quantitative study. And I'm not sure that one can say that. I'd like to about NMR studies of really big molecules, but there's people who might disagree with me that happen to do cryo-EM or, or, or X-ray diffraction. So maybe I've gotten it all wrong. Maybe uh, it's really the small molecule uh, people, the NMR gurus uh, that are involved with small molecules, the, the real spectroscopists uh, after all. Uh, and in that background, Bill Reynolds has really played a major role in defining the small molecule NMR field as we've heard uh, from many accounts today. Uh, no longer is, you know, does the, med the medicinal chemist have to make measurements of his or her own molecule and then search the literature for compounds that are going to be consistent with these measurements. NMR could give them the answer uh, almost always directly. And to be certain, it wasn't easy. I mean, Bell told you the story just a few minutes ago of when he, you know, carried out the complete assignment and structure determination of one natural product that was relatively complex. And the reviewer basically said that it's impossible to do this by NMR. I mean, in, in some respects, that's really a, 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 the highest of compliments, but it doesn't feel that way when your paper's about to get rejected. You know, Bell's come up with multiple new methods for natural product studies. He's exploited birds, and then he exploited flocks, and then he exploited doo-doo birds. He came up with, uh, you know, C13 long-range correlation experiments that put, map, that put on the map, uh, you know, natural product elucidation. And he's also elucidated, you know, hundreds of structures by natural products. And again, even in the area of coming up with acronyms, I really think that the small molecule NMR spectroscopists, including Bell, have done a, a better job than us, uh, you know, us protein guys. I mean, you go back to some of the work of Gary Martin, for example, who came up with cigar and impeach during the times, of course, when Bill Clinton was president of the USA. Or even going back before that, somebody like John Waugh, who pioneered solid state NMR, coming up with proton enhanced nuclear induction spectroscopy. I mean, these are really great names and we have sort of, you know, nosy and cozy and schmozy, but I don't think they're quite as uh, powerful even in that regard. And of course, Bell hasn't just influenced natural product uh, chemistry and natural product NMR. He's made a major contribution to protein science. And I wanna just show you this one paper that indicates that. This was a JAX paper that appeared in 1972. And it dealt with uh, histidines. And histidines are really important mole molecules. They're important amino acids. They're found in 50% you know, of the active sites of enzymes. They're hydrogen bond acceptors and donors. They play a major role in the pH stability of, of, of proteins. And for what I was interested in at the time, it was really this portion of the, uh, of the, uh, of the figure that was, was in his seminal Jack's paper, where we showed that you know, the carbon chemical shift of various carbons in the, 
in the histidine side chain is very much affected by pH. And so by measuring carbon chemical shifts, you could get out uh, information about PKAs. And, and that was something that we were very interested in doing, in particular, not of the ground states of, of protein molecules, but really of the uh, low populated excited states that are essentially invisible. And to do this, and we published this work in a paper several years ago, Alexander Hansen was the, the postdoc who did the work, we took advantage of the seminal studies that, that uh, were provided for to us by, by Bell Reynolds, who essentially showed us that if we measure a few carbon chemical shifts and then supplement that with a, a carbon proton coupling, and we could do this uh, not only for the ground state, but also for the invisible state using something called chemical exchange saturation transfer, a very old technology, uh, that we could get out information about these uh, parameters, which would allow us then to uh, say something about the PKAs of histidines in the invisible state. So this is an example of deja vu all over again, where it's really Bill's seminal work that influenced at least my protein uh, uh, science uh, accomplishments. On a personal note, I first met Bill when I was a graduate student at Yale. I came to uh, Toronto to visit my parents uh, uh, one October, and I wanted to see uh, the NMR facilities that were in uh, in, in chemistry at U of T and, and Bell was the person who took me around. And in fact, even uh, said perhaps in a couple of years, once I learned something, I might uh, be considered uh, a, a suitable faculty member uh, at University of Toronto. Uh, Bell's taken an active interest in my career and in the NMR that I have been doing for, for, for many decades. He's taken me and my wife to Mexico for a North American chemistry conference. He's visited me in the NMR Senate center often during my initial years and he offered me sage advice during a really difficult time for me uh, that had to do with the demise of Agilent. So now at 84, Bell's decided to slow down a little bit, but in uh, his words, he says, I still enjoy keeping up with the NMR literature and, and pursuing occasional pet projects on my own. For example, trying to identify the differences in minor components that might explain why a 20 year old bottle of my favorite dark rum would have a much smoother taste than a five-year-old bottle of the same rum. So Bell, on behalf of your 1,000 plus friends who have turned in, tuned in today, I do hope that you continue with your pet projects. And for those of, uh, of you uh, who are rum aficionados uh, that perhaps are less patient than you, that you discover what it is about a 20-year-old uh, rum uh, bottle that makes it taste so good and that you add that uh, ingredient or those ingredients to uh, your uh, collection of five-year-old uh, bottles. So uh, on behalf of us all, uh, Bell, cheers, l'chaim, and best wishes for many more years of uh, good health and happiness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lewis. That's appreciated. I like the acronyms. <laughs> um, I think that draws this symposium to a close. So I think I'll do this um, on behalf of all the panelists today, all the introducers and, and Lewis on the outro and, and in particular for Bill, we wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, it's been a pleasure for myself, for sure. I, I don't like to speak for others, but I suspect it's been a pleasure for each of the panelists as well. Um, so with that, we'll draw the symposium to close. We hope you're smarter for it. And uh, if we have another one, we'll be sure to advertise. Bye. <laughs>